we can hopefully have a bit of discussion at the end. So, as Neil said, um, I'm based in Glasgow and I've just finished the MFA course. Um, and since graduating last summer, I've started teaching again on the fine art course at Nottingham Trent University. I just do this part time, it's, it's not that handy to get to. Um, and it's something that I did four years before I moved to Scotland, so I was a part time lecturer um, on the fine art course at Nottingham Trent. So, and as Neil, Neil also mentioned, my links to Nottingham Trent go, go back to when I was actually a student there myself. I graduated in, in 2001 from the, the BA Fine Art course. But over the course of the four years that I worked, I've been involved in delivering quite a number of the professional practice components of that course. And I think that actually, actually Nottingham Trent probably is um, quite, uh, well, not, not necessarily a forerunner, but it, it has quite a, an emphasis on professional practice within the fine art programmes there. And I used to organise an event, an annual event, which was called Futures, um, which involved me inviting back ex-graduates from the fine art course to come to talk to the current final year students. So the idea was that they would talk about the journeys or the trajectories that they've been on since graduating so that the current students could pick up some practical tips or, or, or advice. So I've been thinking about my involvement in the, the professional practice component of that course and thinking about being guilty of encouraging current fine arts students to begin thinking about their own lives in terms of following the footsteps of people who've been before them rather than potentially <coughs> attempting to break out of the mould. Um, and also through organising this Futures Day, I think I've certainly become guilty of encouraging art students to think about planning their own futures based on examples and models from the past. And obviously this is a very beautiful way of thinking about the futures to, is to base it on um, people who have kind of been before us and seen what they've done and to copy in some way. But I think that the, what I'm trying to deal with um, in the trajectories project that Neil mentioned and which I'll talk about in a little bit more detail is that I don't think this is a particularly healthy, healthy way of, of thinking about the future. Um, specifically because the future that we, we kind of face at the moment seems so different, as I mentioned, from, from how, how things looked or how, how rosy things looked maybe 10 years ago. So, to talk a bit more about this word trajectory as it's been banded about a bit, it's, it's um, both the kind of the title of the, the thesis of, that I wrote, the subtitle is, is How to Reconcile the Career Mentality with our Impendu Do, which is very catchy, as you can tell. Um, but Trajectories is also simultaneously this project that I'm working on with New Media Scotland um, with, through, through, with an Out W Award where they fund kind of new media projects that artists in Scotland are working on. And this, the website, Trajectories, is supposedly launching this evening, although at the moment there are a few technical hitches still, so hopefully there will be something this evening to launch, um, and that's happening at the in-space in the university campus, so please do come along at six and, and see whether the, there is actually anything um, online by then. The programmer is still very much <laughs> hacking away at it at the moment, back in the <laughs> Um, but the idea of trajectories, as it says here, is that it is a little web-based application which um, is designed to help you compare your life to other people's and to test how you match up against their achievements. Um, so it's essentially helping you to do everything that I was kind of warning you against doing. Um, but I'm hoping that in, in making this kind of, uh, it almost like handing people a tool to enable them to do this, that it kind of draws attention to this um, maybe unhealthy fascination that we have with comparing our lives to other kind of successful role models. So, 
at this point, I was hoping to do a little bit of, dem of a demonstration of, of the website, um, but I'm not able to do that online, so I can just kind of give you a brief idea of what it does <coughs> through a rough sketch. Um, but the idea is that you can enter details about your own life and um, have those organised. And uh, this, this sketch that I have is just ang angular Merkel 4 to the paper, which isn't very useful because you can't make much of a comparison. Um, but the, what, it, what, what the website will do is you'll select yourself um, and then four people from the database or four people of, of your choice, which case you have to research and kind of enter data yourselves. And then it plot, plots these career direct trajectories which are proportional to the length of time that that person has lived and marks out these kind of points of achievement or significant life-changing moments or other points of interest and things that have happened to them. So, Hopefully, very soon, this will actually be working and we've got some postcards at the front here in, with the website address on if you want to pick, pick one of those up. Okay, so I guess the reason for, for um, thinking about trajectories was this, this sort of fascination with um, being aware of this, I guess, this trend in my own personality for comparing my life to other people, but also at the same time being a bit appalled by that sort of behaviour. So I'm kind of looking at it from a subjective and an objective um, perspective and thinking, oh God, I'm, 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 I'm kind of guilty of kind of conducting my life in, in this, this sort of careerist way and that you go from one step to, to the next to the next as you expect that that's what we're meant to do. Um, so, when I um, started on the MFA course, which was two years ago, when I moved to Scotland in 2008, um, I first kind of became aware of these contradictions, which I saw as being kind of inherent in the way that I was operating as an artist. Um, and, this is when I kind of really began to reflect on my own trajectory and to look back at where I'd come from and to sort of consider for the first time the impact of the society that I'd grown up in in shaping the person or the, the artist that I'd ended up becoming. So I was, a ten, uh, I was kind of determined to try to work through these contradictions and to try and find some sort of reconciliation, hence the title in the, the thesis that I wrote, um, which the, the lecture is, is kind of based on. So what I was going to do now is just to kind of read the introduction to the thesis, which is quite autobiographical, and for any of you that may have um, seen some of my other work, there is a kind of autobiographical trend which runs through it. Um, in the, in the before I moved onto the MFA course, I did quite a lot of work that involved looking at my own life and documenting it in, in quite obsessive detail. Um, but as Neil mentioned, the book Confessions of a Recovering Data Collector was in some ways an attempt to reject um, that sort of solipsistic way of working, as I like to describe it, and, and to kind of look outwards at the world. So this, this, this essay, um, which I read now, kind of is, is looking at my own life and, and kind of looking at where I feel I am, but in relation to kind of much bigger um, changes that are going on in political and economic systems. I'll just read um, the introduction, so it'll probably be about five minutes. now emerges as a pivotal year in the recent history of our species. 
On the 6th of October this year, the US Central Bank, the Federal Reserve, increased interest rates by 20 points. This act, which on paper appears of little significance, opened the gates to a whole new breed of free market capitalism, which as the result of reduced regulation would spread its way all over the globe. It signified the switch between Fordism and post-Fordism as the predominant economic system of production. From the disciplinary societies of late modernism, characterised by Foucault, to the control societies which constitute our present reality. It was the beginning of a carefully choreographed and intricately planned neoliberal project which would serve the restoration of naked class power to an economic elite, radically transforming the way in which all our lives would operate in its wake. Our attitudes to work, politics, society, our relationships to one another, even the internal structurings of our own mind would never be the same again. It's no coincidence that it was on the 4th of May 1979 that Margaret Thatcher came to power in the United Kingdom. She was, of course, instrumental in overseeing this revolution. What is coincidental, however, is that it was also in 1979, on the 11th of March to be precise, that my own life began its trajectory. The rapidly changing society into which I was born would not only prove fundamental in shaping the artist I would become, but it would also prove key in determining the mentality with which I would come to visualise my future, to plan my career. Thatcher's children, as my generation are known, were indoctrinated to believe that the world owed us a living. Success, she said, was a mixture of having a flair for a thing that you were doing, knowing that it's not enough, that you've got to have hard work and a certain sense of purpose. It was simply a question of making the right career choice. If we aimed for the top, we had just as much chance of getting there as anyone else. All you had to do was look out for number one. The secret she taught us was to have a strategy. To plan your work for every day and then work your plan. To think about what you wanted your lives to be like in the future and then work flat out towards that goal. In hindsight, it now seems inevitable that my life took the course it did. Entering art school in 1997, the year the seminal sensation exhibition at Royal Academy of Arts took place, we could see success being played out before our very eyes. A group of young British artists just one generation older were now living the dream. As 18-year-old students, we were able to visualise the paths we wanted our lives to take, to see exactly where we wanted to find our fortune. Like most of our art school peers, I was from an above-average social background, raised in suburbia by a middle-class family of teachers. And as hands are in notes, this added social capital gave me the flair, self-assurance and sense of audacity which now seemed so essential to commodify and sell myself, to keep going regardless of rejection and failure, with my eyes firmly fixed on the prize. My career trajectory led me blinkered along a familiar path. A BA honours degree in Fine Art from Nottingham Trent University, a postgraduate diploma in Fine Art from Goldsmith College, where nearly all my YBA role models have been before me. It was as though every incremental step took me closer towards my goal, towards success. Finally, I won a scholarship to study on the Master of Fine Art program at Glasgow School of Art yet another prestigious art school to add to my expanding curriculum later. But what I haven't banked on, however, was that on the very same day that I was heading up the M1 to Glasgow to begin this new stage in my life, the global economic order was fast collapsing around us into its own new distinct epoch, taking with it the belief systems which have been carefully constructed around it over the past 29 years. For it was on the 15th of September 2008, the investment bank Lehman Brothers Holdings Inc. 
found the biggest bankruptcy in US history with more than $60 billion of debt. Over the course of the next year, a slew of bailouts took place all over the world to prevent other banks going under. The neoliberal project had in every sense been discredited. The ideology in which, knowing me or not, my own life's trajectory had been modelled was now on the scrap heap. Society appeared had reached a hiatus, a ground zero amidst a sea of ideological rubble. Lots of suggestions emerged about what had gone wrong and lots of questions about where we should go next. From the privilege of my funded MFA place, I was able to enter into my own period of self-reflection about the path that I had so blindly been following. Was the vision I held in my life in the future essentially a delusion based on a now defunct model of success from the past? Was I suffering from the self-deceit hands up in diagnosis to be prevalent in young artists, coupled with a complete disavowal of the negative side effects of my complicity in the system of capital. With a sudden overwhelming urgency, it felt essential that I begin to question how I could reconcile my career choice and the entrepreneurial methodology with which I was pursuing it, with the harsh realities that both science and now science fiction of predicting the future actually holds in store. Okay. So that extract just is kind of gives a sets the scene really for the rest of the, the essay, which I'm kind of trying to unpick some of the questions that I raised in that last um, paragraph as we as we move through. Um, but the ending doom that I'm referring to is essentially the environmental crisis or climate change which is likely to unfold over the next, cen over the next century. Um, and this dissertation was written, um, well it was written last summer and I began researching for it kind of around about this time last year which was just after Copenhagen, um, the, international, the United Nations International Climate um, summit took place and essentially failed to, to meet any resolution. So at that time, as I'm sure you all remember, it was in the news a lot. Um, but since then, the, um, the kind of the climate change has kind of completely disappeared off the media agenda and it's been replaced by this alternative doom. Um, which I'll talk about later, which is the more immediate um, funding cuts to public services and things that are happening um, that kind of take over, have taken over the, the headlines for the time being. Um, but this, this graph which I've got or up on the projection at the moment was what I used to kind of preface the dissertation. And it's extracted from the government's official response to um, the Copenhagen conference, um, which gives an estimate of the median temperature rise, global temperature rise, over the course of the next century. And it, the line across the middle um, marks what is kind of referred to by the majority of scientists as a tipping point at which climate change becomes, well, run, kind of runaway climate change in that uh, after a certain point, which is two degrees um, median temperature rise, that uh, the oceans are kind of diluted to a, to a certain level because ice caps have melted and that there are all of these other stores of carbon that exist at the bottom of the oceans and in other places which will then kind of be released and things will be going to warm up beyond control. So the big question that I was posing to myself in this dissertation and I'm posing to you now I suppose is that how could I and how could anybody else continue to carry on um, worrying about or following these kind of closely mapped out career trajectories down a specific path um, 
that our role models before us have gone, um, when we can no longer even assume that we would be living in the same conditions, um, that the same resources would be available, or that the same opportunities would even exist. When the real truth is, the truth that, that it doesn't seem that, I mean, any of us are kind of able to, to face up to, but the, the truth that the scientific evidence is pointing towards is that we're kind of on the brink of a very different world. So, I tried to think about using this graph as a kind of preface for the, for the thesis, I tried to think about the, the absurdity of, of overlaying one of those career trajectories, something like the trajectories project might generate, over a graph like this, and thinking, well, in, in 2042, or whenever it's estimated that this tipping point is, is reached, having a, a machine emailing me with a reminder that uh, I should have won the Turner Prize by, by then if I'm on the same career trajectory as somebody else that I'm um, kind of using as a role model, that, that that becomes quite an absurd thing. So I guess I'm using these extremes as a way of kind of shocking myself, I suppose, into, into rethinking exactly what it is that I'm doing. Um, so what I'm trying to do with the thesis, which um, is why the opening paragraph that I read and, and some of the following paragraphs refer to economic policy specifically, was to, to make clear the link between um, the kind of um, never-ending appetite of capitalism and the environmental crisis and, and that we're kind of fast approaching. And as I mentioned now, it seems in terms of the media, the tables have turned in, in, in terms of what is actually um, being reported in that this long-term crisis um, isn't really, doesn't seem really to be significant anymore because we can't really grasp what it's going to be like. And it's been replaced with this immediate short-term crisis of, of funding cuts and um, crisis in the economy. So the, the irony of that, of course, is that the, the recession is probably quite good for the environment and that people don't have lots of money to spend on unnecessary things. Um, but nevertheless, both of these, these dooms that I'm talking about, the short-term doom um, in terms of funding cuts and the long-term doom, both of them kind of require a radical rethink um, about how we think about what we will do with our lives um, compared to the models that we're kind of used to, used to seeing of the successful artist. Um, so the section, the, the essay that I read, as I mentioned, is quite autobiographical in terms of looking at history um, in terms of my own lifespan. So going back to this 1979, which I kind of was the year that I was born, but also began to realise that a lot happened in that year in terms of the kickstarting of a, a kind of new way of um, a new economic policy which kind of had knock on effects throughout the whole of society. Um, but I, I guess I was inspired by this idea of the trajectory um, in terms of looking at the world in, in, in life size chunks. So being able to use your own life as a yardstick in some way to help understand um, changes and developments um, in society. So something which I obviously did when I saw this graph was to kind of try to work out how old I would be in, a, in 2042 when, when things start to, to maybe look really shit. Um, and I'll be 63, so I know that it's just one of those kind of uh, natural instincts to look at something like this and go, okay, um, how do I fit into this? How does this affect me in terms of my own life? Um, but to go back to this kind of this, the period of history that I outlined in the introduction, it kind of covers the rise of. Um, more Margaret Thatcher's rise to power and the mainstream implementation 
of neoliberal policies, um, which had the aim of putting the emphasis on individuals um, being left to compete with, it, with one another and to make their own success um, in a survival of the fittest sort of way, as opposed to a, a traditional socialist model in which you may have a strong state which has the obligation to look out for and protect vulnerable people. So that was kind of the major shift that happened, it certainly in this country over that period. But I want to hone in now on a more recent history um, and to look specifically at the last 10 years um, or since the Labour government came into power in, in 1997. Um, and to look at the, the effect that this sort of neoliberal um, policy making um, had when it was adopted by the so-called left-wing party when they came into, into power and the impact that this had on careers, and specifically our careers in the, in the creative industries. Um, so one of the first things that the Labour government did in 1997 was to magic this new industry out of thin air. And it was a pretty ingenious idea which was obviously inspired by the success of the YBAs and the success of other homegrown talent like the Britpop phenomenon and things that happened in the 90s. Um, so some pretty clever analysis of that made them realise um, that they could attempt to harness the potential and to create jobs and to make people believe that they could realistically have a career as an artist or a designer or a curator or any of these other kind of freelance jobs um, if that's what they wanted to do. And also, the benefit of this is that it, it would be rewarding work rather than slog slogging away in a factory somewhere and that it could actually be quite fun. And alongside this belief was uh, a lot of investment, of course, and record amounts of public money, uh, money being channeled into the arts over, over the 10 years um, after they came into power, which now is obviously kind of abruptly coming to an end, certainly in England, um, and we get to kind of see the impact of what's going to happen in Scotland in terms of um, Creative Scotland, but it looks like it's heading in a, in a similar direction. So the funding that was available during that period was obviously one of the, one of the positive side effects of the emphasis on the creative industries. But one of the negative things was this idea of the industrialisation of Bohemia, um, which is something that Andrew Ross refers to. Um, and that's the idea that these kind of business mentalities or entrepreneurial models um, become the predominant ways of working within the arts. And with that, of course, the um, notion of competition, which is something that Thatcher so fervently encouraged as being healthy, um, comes to the forefront of creativity. So that's where the professional practice comes in. My um, entire art education uh, has happened within this period of kind of development in the creative industries, apart from perhaps um, the last part. Um, and so this, yeah, this period from 97 up until 2007, which is when cutbacks kind of first, first started to happen, that you can kind of trace it back to a speech that Tony Blair made at Tate Modern in 2007, which is quite a famous speech where he kind of reminisced about this period of time as though it was something that was most certainly um, coming to an end and being phased out, referring to it as, as a golden age. Um, but this golden age in, in, in the arts in this country and, and the development of the creative industries uh, was matched in art school with the development of professional practice programmes. <coughs> um, although I do admit that some, some art schools were certainly 
more on the ball in terms of implementing these. I think a uh, kind of mixed reports about people depending on where they've gone, but certainly the art school, but not in general, the art school that I know was very kind of at the forefront of, of, of making sure that um, its students understood kind of the competitive um, atmosphere that they were going to be going out into when they graduated. So in many ways I feel like I'm almost a guinea pig for the effects of the, um, this um, kind of implementation of a new type of education, I suppose. Um, when I emerged from our school in 2001, I felt that I had this fledgling set of skills which over the course of the next few years I began to, to hone and develop because it felt that that's what I was meant to do. If, that's what, if I wanted to become an artist. So, to look at the, these skills and kind of identify them, um, the first skill that I felt I kind of developed on my BA was a skill for self-promotion and marketing. Um, and this is something that came out of... Um, well, I was lucky that I... I don't know whether I was lucky that I was given an introduction to web design as a BA student, and we were kind of told the the the, the um, importance of the internet as a kind of marketing tool and a way of getting your work out there. So within the a year of graduating, actually in my final year, I'd already set up a website, which I know is quite commonplace between uh, amongst art students. So this idea of self promotion the marketing was, was a skill that I felt that I didn't, nece didn't necessarily have it down, but it was something that I was beginning to hone. Um, and this idea of entrepreneurialism as well. Yeah, so within a year of graduating, I organised my first solo exhibition in London and managed to get through, through some, I guess, full-on marketing bombarding, I managed to get that um, previewed in the Guardian and from that it was picked up for an exhibition at this project E22 was picked up for an exhibition in the Science Museum which led on to the work being sold to the Wellcome Collection where it's now on permanent display. So this kind of entrepreneurialism was something that I felt that I could do I suppose or something that I'd, I'd been taught to, to develop in myself. And there was also this idea of self-management and self-employment, which didn't come immediately, but after graduating, I went, um, a few years after graduating, I began to, to kind of look at the way that um, I ran my career in terms of a business, not necessarily money-making business, I might add, but in terms of being self-employed and keeping your books and all of those things, and went to workshops at the year and revenue and stuff to, to develop those skills. Um, but the final thing I think I kind of came out of art school with was, was with, with this idea that you could ask for money for projects and that you weren't afraid to do that. Um, and this was a big project that I organised in 2005. So actually the funding application was, was written in 2004 and this really was the kind of glory days of, of this is, well, I was still based in Nottingham at this point, so I'm talking about Arts Council England. Um, but this was the glory days of the funding, specifically in, well, in the regions outside London, because this, this project, which was a curatorial project, um, got nearly £50,000 worth of funding from the Arts Council and toured to three venues. and. Um, had a publication made. Um, so these kind of skills are things that I, I just kind of um, utilised, I suppose, to try to find my way in, in those first few years after graduating, um, some a lot more successfully than others. Um, and I know that I'm not alone in these skills that I've developed because I kind of see evidence of this stuff happening all around me. I see nearly every artist um, that I know has some sort of website or is in the process of making one. Um, and that 
that everyone is um, kind of busy promoting their own little projects. So, the thing that I want to kind of reflect on in all of this, I suppose, is the emphasis of the word self in that is kind of repeated in words like self-employment and self-reliance and self-sufficiency and all of these um, things that come along with the development of the, the creative industries or the neoliberalisation of culture is another way that it's been referred to. Um, and this idea that you are um, unique and you're marketing your unique product, but also the fact that your uniqueness in a way is your genericness because um, we're all kind of operating in these little bubbles, so we're not actually doing anything particularly unique um, in that we're all kind of a generic new form of worker. So looking back, I think that the, the greatest thing that I took from professional practice was this idea of how um, competitive the industry that I was going into was and that I had to try to do anything or everything in my power to become a successful artist. Um, and one of the most striking things that I remember hearing over the course of my research for the dissertation um, this is something that I heard at a discussion that I went to um, was the idea that, that, that well, the capitalist um, society or, or specifically neoliberalisation kind of enhances or exacerbates the worst of all of human characteristics. So it exacerbates this, this competitive society or in a talent-led economy or a meritocracy where people who have talent or have skills kind of succeed, um, you always get these complete a sort of underclass of people who, who don't succeed or who fail or who are turned losers, that there's kind of two sides of the coin. Um, and that all of this education produces um, highly competitive units which um, kind of produces these people that kind of been bred into a survival of the fittest mentality. So, to go back to the graph here, it becomes evident that it's not really logical to, to kind of blindly carry on competing with each other, um, unless indeed, and this is one of the things that I kind of looked into when I was researching, unless the, the, the human species itself has some sort of suicide mission. So, yeah, the conclusion of, of the thesis the idea that I wanted to do but in identifying these skills that I thought that I had was to think of ways in which you could reconfigure them. So it wasn't about going back to, to basics and rejecting all of these skills that have kind of been imposed on, on us or things that we'd learned, but a way of kind of um, utilising them or, or, or reconfiguring them so that they could be used as tools almost against the system that had bred them. So, I came up with a plan of action um, which is quite idealistic and it kind of terrified me, but it emerged out of trying to identify all of the negative things about the, the situation um, that we find ourselves in now, and then thinking, well, how could we completely reject this? So the, the plan of action was a way of kind of getting to, to my conclusion. Um, but the kind of like practical steps which I do sort of try to live by now, some of them are more realistic than others, um, but they're things that I try to at least think about when I'm operating um, as an artist and just as a, a general citizen of planet Earth. Um, but the main, the main thing that, that I took from the, the two years that I spent kind of on the MFA course in this sort of period of self-reflection was this idea of actually 
standing back and taking a look at the system that you're kind of enveloped in. Um, so that was kind of point one, is that that seemed essential, that rather than carrying on blindly on this trajectory, that you kind of take, take a step back and, and look at where it is that you're situated. And then the second point kind of looks at um, maybe the role of the artist within all of this and what you can aim to do um, with your work and what art can aim to do that other forms of, of, of criticism um, maybe can't. And that's to offer, offer this kind of external critique of the system so that in some way the work challenges or tries to deal with or at least draw attention to these, these, these systems that um, may not necessarily be visible. The other idea was to develop ways of working outside institutions um, in that the institutions at the moment, the arts institutions are generally the ones that perpetuate these myths of, of um, what it means to be successful. So the idea that you can kind of break away from that and operate outside. But I guess most importantly, and this relates to this idea of competitive nature of the society that we've grown up in, is this idea of escaping solipsism, so trying to break out of the empire of the self um, and working with and not against your peers. Um, and there is obviously evidence of that happening when, when students graduate and form collectives or form studio groups and things like that. And I think that those activities are very, very important and should should um, continue to, to, to become important models for, for working. This idea of rejecting ego is something that is obviously challenging to, to most artists, um, but it comes out of researching this, specifically a book um, called The Coming Insurrection by the Invisible Committee, which very much advocates the idea of invisibility, so it shouldn't just be about making me um, look at how, how great what I'm doing is, um, but more about not caring so much about, about a brand, I suppose, or, or how, how you're seen from the outside, it's that can be kind of a major blockage to, to what it is that you're trying to do. Um, this idea of creating three ideas that objects for sale comes from uh, the idea of looking at the, the potential of imagination in terms of actually using it to, to produce practical solutions to the problems rather than creating um, unnecessary things, I suppose, just for the market. And the final point is the idea of abandoning the trajectory altogether and finding motivation in what we're doing now. So this idea, this, and all of these things I'm not saying that I've totally embraced and that I've got, got down to a T, because they're all quite challenging. Um, but the idea of, of, of not thinking so much about where one stage, where one stage will, how one thing will get you to the next thing to get you to the next thing. Um, in terms of, of, of moving along this career trajectory, but more kind of focusing on, on what, what it is you're actually doing now. Um, so, the, from kind of looking at those seven points and thinking about how you could um, begin to, to, to realise some of them, or to begin to embody some of them, and not wanting, as I said, to sort of throw away all of these skills that um, you've been taught or that you've developed. I kind of tried to identify three key things that I saw in myself and I saw in other artists 
um, that would be useful to kind of helping make these changes or automatically re rethink what it is we're doing. So, um, this idea that comes from Hans Allen book, which I mentioned in the introduction, um, Hans Allen's book is called Why Art is Poor, and it kind of looks at um, where, where, where artists generally come from, the backgrounds that artists come from, and what their motivations might be. But as I outlined in, in the introduction, that this kind of um, the archetypal artist has this kind of self-assurance and a flair and a sense of audacity, I suppose. Maybe that thing that makes them think that what they've got to say is worth listening to um, could actually be useful in terms of giving them the confidence to stand outside of an existing system. So in terms of trying to harness this as a resource, in, in one of you, and in, in me specifically, it's about kind of harnessing, I guess, in a way, that confidence. <clears throat> and then um, reconfiguring that as being a positive force to actually say, look, there's something not right here, there's something, we need to change what's going on here, um, and not being worried about the consequences. Um, so that was the first of the, the kind of skills that, that I thought were useful, but were, it would be worth salvaging um, the skills that artists have. The other things that I kind of identified, and this is something that comes from specifically analysis of working conditions um, within the neoliberal era, so from, from, or, or control society from 79 onwards, is looking at the way that, that jobs have evolved um, so that we are more flexible, um, more nomadic, and more spontaneous in our approach to work. So even though these, these can be quite disorientated things and that there's a lot of job um, insecurity, um, and that there's no longer this concept of, of the job for life, that actually this kind of flexibility and this ability to move around is potentially a useful thing, especially as we progress further into the century, um, and we don't, when we're faced with such kind of uncertainty about how climate change may begin to affect our lives, that, that this ability to be flexible is certainly a useful skill. So this is something that, another of the, the things that I thought it was worth salvaging and attempting to, to reconfigure. Um, and the final thing, which I think is maybe the most important, is the work ethic. The work ethic that I see in myself, but also in artists all around me, is that people are prepared to slave away for ridiculous hours, um, not 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 taking breaks and just um, not being paid. So relentlessly working on a project with for no monetary gain at all, um, but just because there's some sort of intrinsic motivation, something that that is kind of motivating us to keep going. So that I think is the most um, significant of all of the, the characteristics, I suppose, that I identified as, as being central to the way that artists work. So I began to think about how, what a power, powerful positive force for change this could be if you could harness it in some way and reconfigure it. So, um, just to finish up with some kind of practical examples about how I have attempted to try and embody some of these theories in my own, in my own life and the way that I conduct myself. Um, I began to, well, I began, I became continually frustrated about travelling around the country, which is something that I do a lot now that I live in Nottingham, and, uh, sorry, that I live in Glasgow and now working in Nottingham, I spend a lot of time on the trains. 
Um, but this, and, and, and they're in a, obviously in a shambolic state, which kind of results from the way in which they were broken up by um, the Conservative government in the 90s and sold off so that they were sold off to private companies. So these things kind of, all of these issues are interconnected as far as I'm concerned in that this, this privatisation of the, the railways um, was a knock-on effect of neoliberalisation in this country. Uh, but it's also something that I see the, the direct effect of um, by having a really bad public transport system. So I began to think of the public transport system as sim really, really symbolising um, the very foundations of a fair and just society. So it seemed that if you had a good public transport system that was run for the people who use it rather than for shareholders who own the companies, that that would be um, kind of the very foundations of a, of a fair and a just and a happy and a, cal a low carbon world. So kind of all of these issues were linked together and I found a lot of personal frustration travelling around. So I thought, well I'll try to do something about this, something active. So this is not an art project in the scientist, but I guess it's it's a way of me trying to um, reconfigure some of my skills in terms of marketing and web skills and branding to attempt to directly um, affect some sort of change. And if, even if it is quite an enormous ask that we're asking for, for the, the renationalisation of the, whole, of the entire country's um, railway system, but at the very least, it's drawing attention to the fact that these, these um, railway systems are run for profit making, run by profit making companies. So it's kind of um, <coughs> at least take, make, uh, making people who become aware of the campaign um, take a second look at the, um, the way that the system is run um, and potentially think about um, how unfair it is, I suppose, and how it could be how it could be done better. So that's a, a kind of a real example of what I've tried to do. In a way it's kind of, I I I attempt to, to work on, on the campaign for one day a week. So it's kind of quite a clunky way of like dividing up my time, but I know other artists who kind of Try to divide their time in different ways, and time is obviously something that is, is very um, precious to, to artists who kind of, well, it's something, it's a commodity, uh, uh, something that is kind of very scarce, I suppose, in terms of all of the other obligations that we have. Um, the other thing I did last year was to, to launch an environmental policy um, which I've now publicised via my website. So it is exactly what it says, it, it, it is an environmental policy which just kind of outlines all of the different things that I do in my own life to try to reduce my carbon footprint. Um, it has different headings in terms of diet, energy, no transport, um, Recycling materials, etc., etc. Um, so the idea of making this public was, in some way, to sort of, I guess, make people reassess the way that they run their own lives. But I was also kind of trying to tap into this business language. Um, well, I suppose the idea of a policy and the idea of an individual having a policy, which I, I think. Um, is, is quite a curious thing, but it's something that people obviously do have um, rules with which they, they hope to, to, to con conduct their lives by. So I just um, thought that by making this public, that it would draw people's attention to, to maybe the necessity to look at the little details in their own lives, um, but also it would act as something that would make me 
stick to my promises, I suppose, that are kind of hang over me. And I, I have kind of, I have um, come up against some occasions where I've broken the environmental policy and then felt a huge amount of guilt, but I've also been able to use it as an excuse for not doing things, which has been quite useful. So I can say, well, I, can, I can't come down to, to do such and such events that contravenes my environmental policy, um, which I think is, is quite interesting. And it kind of leads to this, the, the, the specific heading at the top, which relates to diet, I was quite interested in because um, the idea of a company having an environmental policy and having diet at the top it seems quite absurd that you could, you could um, ensure that all of your employees adhere to some sort of strict diet. But I did become vegan when, well, two years ago now, as a, as a result of finding out about the impact of um, the livestock industry on, um, the, on carbon emissions, on climate change. So I kind of thought it was quite interesting to put that as my first point in the, um, in the policy. And I continue to kind of advocate the, the vegan diet wherever possible, imposing it on people. Um, now to, to, to talk about a different project which is slightly more light-hearted, um, relates to this idea of, I guess, collectivity or working together with people. Um, and this is a, again a project that's kind of risen over the course of the last year, which is a direct response to funding cuts and these things, um, the changes that we're kind of facing in terms of uh, working in, in the arts. So it's, yeah, it is an artist lottery syndicate, it's a group of 40 artists from all over the country who are joining forces to attempt to win the lottery in the course of the next year. Um, and uh, it, it really exists. We do play the lottery, and we, if we do win, um, which at the moment is only like increasingly unlikely because we, <laughs> we have spent a lot of money and not won a huge amount back. Um, but if we, if we do win, I like the idea of the kind of syndicate itself being a metaphor for the way in which we, we should sort of. Um, attempt to, I suppose, work together in that if we do win, it's not just one of us that succeeds, but rather it's all 40 of us who kind of all succeed kind of a little bit less, but that that sort of, that wealth, I suppose, or, or that success is shared out equally amongst us. So I like the idea of a syndicate as a sort of metaphor for that. And this is us at the launch event, it's not all 40 of us, because not everyone could make it. Um, but this is us sort of tempting our own fate by opening a bottle of champagne before we do even enter the single draw. Uh, but we did win, um, I think, £10 that night, which is uh, 20 pence each or something. So it wasn't all doom and gloom. Um, and just a, a couple of final examples of, of things that are going on that I kind of look at now as been quite inspirational. Um, this is a group of artists, um, well, it says here, if you can read that, workers in culture and education, so it's specifically people who have kind of been, I guess, bred by that bread or, or raised under the kind of the creative industries banner um, that are now finding all sorts of challenges due to the, the knock-on effects of cuts. So they're kind of banding together in this precarious workers' brigade um, and taking action, I suppose. So take real kind of um, getting involved in protests and they this 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 is a group that's running in London, it's operating in London. Um, so I, I haven't actually been physically involved in it, but I'm kind of keeping an eye on what they're doing via the email list. 
but at the time of all of the student protests and things, they took their carrot along to um, Westminster. And the idea of the carrot is, is that it, if you think about it in terms of those trajectories, it's that thing that you think that you're working towards, that idea of the successful artist, or this, this, this promise, if you like, that doesn't necessarily exist. So I like the idea of the carrot workers, brigade, brigade, and in terms of kind of solidarity between these people who are precarious and who are quite isolated, but that they're coming together and working together. And I guess some of the carrots, that's an artist called Ori Ashari, who is based out in London, but of course he's completely anonymous, we don't need to know her name. Um, and then the the final example is something that I had spoken about in at Chamway when the in Chamway Girls Go when the Art is in Juicy exhibition was on. I don't know if anybody got over to see it, but there was a symposium kind of looking at the ideas that his his work was videos of different protests and marches happening um, all over the globe in different contexts. And there was a, a symposium alongside that looking at the relationship between politics and art. And a curator called Tony, Tony Olaf Nielsen, a Danish curator, came and gave a presentation about a project called the Trampoline House in Denmark, um, which came out of, and I don't know if you can read that, but just when it says, What is the Trampoline House there? It's, a project which came out of an organisation called the Academy for Untamed Creativity, which is something in Copenhagen. I really like that idea of the untamed creativity and kind of relating back to some of the points from my plan of action, this idea of how useful could this imagination or this creativity be if rechanneled into to sort of more worthwhile or, or or less self-indulgent projects. So, the Trampoline House is actually uh, a um, sort of community centre for immigrants in Denmark. Um, so, a place where people can kind of come together and, and learn and to meet each other and, and talk about things and organise events. So, it's kind of like a community centre, which again isn't an art project like the, the Bring Back Great British Rail campaign is an, an art project either, but it's something that's kind of been motivated by artists and has come from that energy and that work, work ethic and all of those other things that I identified as being these really useful and really important skills and characteristics that we have. So I think that that is, is another sort of great example of how, how energy and motivation can be reconfigured. And the name of the, the, the um, person who organised that, Tony Nielsen, um, she works in partnership with this Danish group called Curatoris Action, which actually translates as curatorial action, I think. So it's a kind of curatorial partnership that, that aims to sort of take direct action. Um, and the final thing is the Scottish Artists Union, which I always like to promote a lot because it's something that um, will become more influential and more significant the more people who join it. It's about kind of power and numbers. And so I always like to emphasize the importance of it. And it does have a huge number of uh, members at the moment, but nowhere near as, as many as there are artists in Scotland. But I think that it's a, it's a uh, like the precarious workers brigade, who are kind of all of these kind of individuals who find themselves in these precarious positions, competing with each other, that the, the Scottish Artists Union is kind of turning all of that on its head and it's saying, well, we're all in the same boat really, so let's kind of um, join together in a union, and it's the it, it is the first new trade union of the 21st century and I think it's quite symbolic for that reason because it 
is an attempt to unify these people who are characteristically working as individuals, which is kind of um, no union really, uh, other than equity, which is, is the actors' union. No other union has kind of really taken on that challenge. Um, but I think it's a challenge that, that is important to, to face. Um, so, that's, that's about all that I've got to prepare. And I think I may have gone on for quite a long time. Well, I'm only about an hour. So, I'm sorry if that, that has um, gone longer than you expected. But it would be interesting if anyone has any questions or anything that they want to, to raise in relation to things that I've talked about, um, that that would be the time to do it. Scotland specifically that use that model, 
Um, it's, it's against the constitution to pay the people who are running the, the galleries any money. So they kind of do work for free, but they work for free for a massive carrot. And if you look at the kind of, and this is something that I've actually researched quite a lot doing trajectories, is because um, one thing I wasn't able to show you is that I've got a kind of database of a hundred key people who, who, who I may find myself comparing myself to. Um, and a few, there's, there's, there's a few artists in there, one of them is Simon Starling, who was on the Committee of Transmission. And like, looking at all of these other people who have been on the Committee of Transmission and then looking at them actually getting solo shows there like one or two years later, it's quite a huge sort of reoccurrence. So that becomes a carrot, I suppose, and that people are working because they think that that some way it's going to be a step, a step up the ladder, I suppose. So they're working for free because, because they think that they're going to get that, that show at the end of it. So I do think that that is quite dubious and it does need a rethink. And I think that um, something like the Precarious Workers Brigade, which kind of is a sort of crossover, I suppose, in terms of protest, in terms of an art group, a creative protest, um, an art collective. Um, I think that maybe and something another another example that I refer to actually in the dissertation is the, the lab, laboratory of um, <laughs> what it stands on. No, I'm sorry. It's the the laboratory imaginary interaction. So it's kind of it's a group that's kind of been. Um, set up to bring together specifically activists and artists to see what can happen when, when these two things merge together. Um, and then another, another model that I kind of refer to is the Superplex model, who kind of define themselves, I don't know if you know Superplex as well, but again they're Danish, and they work across lots of different fields, so they have some projects um, in terms of their practice, they call themselves artists, designers, activists, in that they, um, they do some projects which are quite conventional art projects, and they've worked with Freeze and they've worked with a lot of the big institutions, but they also run other projects which have more direct impact, or are more kind of directly activist related projects, or they're quite. Um, Ironically, they're quite famous for, um, in the 90s, doing projects which were very similar to the sort of things that a, uh, like a, a non-governmental organisation might do in Africa, that they would set up um, practical energy generation projects. So, but I think that they're an interesting model to, to look at because they use that flexibility and that, that nomadism and those things that was kind of highlighting. Yes, I think that the and the modes of resistance are the same as the modes of domination. They kind of mirror each other. I think that just the way. Yeah, I think I think that that's. I guess maybe that's what I'm implying is that it's not possible to step out entirely. So you've got to look at what you've got and look at the system that you're operating within and to try to to do, to reconfigure it or to tweak it or to turn it against itself. I suppose. Let's get another question.
kind of lost the failures of government policy. We so did you which artist did you mention at the beginning? Oh okay. Sorry. Okay, so kind of artistic practices that you're discussing. You know, maybe go to the artistic practices that they use art for art Sunday and it has an art exhibition space. Yeah. Um well it's something that kind of because yeah, well, one of the things that I kind of talked through in the, in, the, in the dissertation was this that you come to this point where, like you say, it seems that art isn't the best best way forward, that there may be kind of, that, that maybe the conclusion is to abandon art altogether. So I guess I started to, to think about um, maybe the role of ego in that, I suppose. And it's something that I, I, I have a kind of conflict in within myself about the campaign um, that I ran because it was genuinely motivated by being pissed off by travelling on the trains and thinking that there's a better system for running it. But once it's set up and it's running, and now I start to think, well, am I running this campaign because now that's part of who I am as an artist? And, and that all of these other like weird kind of complications or compromises come into the equation which and, and then the role of, of me kind of as the I guess the coordinator like my um, personality or me as an artist running it whether that gives it some sort of other um, so it takes on a different life of its own than it would if just a normal kind of Training enthusiast was running it, and whether that's a bad thing or whether that's a good thing, like all of these issues I'm still kind of working through, trying to work through in a practical way and and through thinking and worrying a lot, I suppose. But um, yeah, I think I, I think it's it's an interesting question, and and um, yeah, so. I hope that, I hope that sort of kind of answered it now. Sorry, um, if you were to self-identify as like a genre of artists, would you call yourself an environmental artist? Would you call yourself like what sort of artist? Or do you do you find a need to do that? Um, I think. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I can't. I mean, one thing that. I'm really interested in this sort of straddling of different roles, I suppose. I think that that's one of the, the main things that I'm kind of interested in. And the battle between different elements of my personality. I suppose maybe that's why some of these things that I've been talking about seem to directly oppose or contradict each other. Is that I feel being that they, that they kind of continually pull and pushed in different directions. So, um, I, I like the con I, I think that there is a kind of contra conflict between the role of artist and activist and I'm kind of interested in that sort of merging. But the other thing that I kind of bring to that <laughs> equation is this idea of administration. And if you know some of my own work, you'll see that it's kind of heavy on, on, on data, this idea of data and playing around with kind of the ways in which business operates. Um, so I like this idea of kind of emerging somewhere between an artist, activist and administrator, or that it's where those three roles meet, or the conflict between the three things, where I kind of define myself. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, um,
you know, think about it as being progressive, move forward, that's to something quite sort of yeah. nostalgic or regressive. Yeah. Perhaps in that you could kind of undo this kind of neoliberalism and um, this kind of privatisation in that sense. So that was another thing, and then the third thing um, was, come on. <coughs> oh yeah, I suppose it's a good kind of one of what you were saying. Um, of um, the sort of thing, um, are you being sort of complicit in some way as, as by being things like the idea of students of flexibility and sort of maybe almost romanticising mm -hmm. that, you know, when it's, you know, sort of like a vulnerability as well, we're talking about, and it falls into like kind of um, apparent feelings, if you like, of sort of government support in terms of you know, this idea of how to cope with the now. Um, so I realise it's quite obvious, I suppose. Onto the yeah. Yeah. No, well, there are obviously things that are kind of like it's this idea of the, the tension that's kind of everything that I'm trying to do, I suppose, to try and navigate this conflict that I see as being inherent of who I feel that I am at the moment. Um, in terms of the campaign, that's something that a lot of um, people respond to. That it does have kind of a nostalgic feel to it. And I became really interested in, in well, the idea that the campaign could be nostalgic but also be, be an improvement on the old British Rail. Um, but then it kind of, kind of comes down to sort of writing a manifesto for how a new rail system would operate. But I'm interested in kind of like cooperative models and looking at an alternative where kind of the, rather than a share, shareholders being a priority, that the passengers who are actually using the service, it's not necessarily run by a state, the state, but it could be something that's run at arm's length, but then it's also um, that the people who use the system are in some way invested in it and, are, and, and are, they know that the money that they're paying for tickets is kind of being reinvested in that. So I think that it's it's kind of Corbyn by British Rail is a kind of statement about what we used to used to have, I suppose, but it's still still hoping for that something better will emerge at the end of it. And something that, that isn't just a regression. But that's train that's train policy. And I'm not an expert but I'm learning. <laughs> well, we, we need to finish in, uh, in like a minute, but otherwise we'll miss the whole bunch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but has anybody got a really quick question you think you, 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 you want to ask? <laughs> okay, good, good, good. I was just still thinking about the, the idea of the car, um, and whether there was ever, whether, whether there's ever not a car. Or whether, see, I'm still, I'm still stuck on the, the, the idea of careerist mentality as well, and mm -hmm. whether that's something that you have to reconcile or change. Um, so, whether like, there is a different trajectory or number of trajectories, if you've still got careerist mentality, you know, it's, it's the mentality that you're talking about um, changing rather than necessarily operating in different ways. So, yeah, operating. Um, one way can think that to um, agendas of the living agendas of. But um, yeah. I don't, yeah, that was my question. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think something, I, I don't know whether I mentioned it, but I think that um, a lot of these things are just inherent human characteristics, but that sometimes the, the situations that we're thrown in kind of exacerbate more negative elements and I think that's kind of happened what's happened is that we of course we look out for ourselves because we're, we're animals and kind of that's what happens in nature but that when we're thrown into a situation like um, or, or when kind of certain things are emphasized uh, that we're kind of forced to, to compete more naturally I suppose so yeah well, I think that's good. Good point, Edward. Okay, thanks a lot. And, uh...